Welcome, Gary Jonas from How Property Group. I'm so excited to talk with you. Gary, let's do it. All right. I'm excited to talk to you too. And I love your energy today on this rainy day. Ready to rock and roll. Beautiful. And the hot topic and the challenge that investors and developers are having today, how to make deals. Great topic. I am sure that everybody is interested in this topic because everybody is having the same problems, right? Like it is very, very difficult to make deals work in real estate today. And when I look at it, like the thing that when you did deals 20 years ago, you did them to create equity and to grow the value of real estate. And long term, that was the benefit. And if you had a little cash flow, that was good. And then over the last 20 years, we've been spoiled as rates have gone down and rents have gone up and we've created these great cash flow streams. And now all of a sudden, with a huge increase in rates over the last couple of years and construction costs going up and rents kind of flattening out a little bit, we're almost back to where we were 20 years ago, where deals just don't work from a cash flow standpoint anymore. And the struggle is investors are used to that return. They're not willing to go back to kind of what it looked like 20 years ago. So what do you do, right? How do you fill those gaps? Those are the questions that we have to answer as developers. Those are some big questions to answer. One of the things that I hear people say, and if someone says it to me one more time, I might jump out the window. What am I going to say? I don't know. I don't want you to jump out the window. So I'm not saying it. Their solution is mm -hmm. I'm going to wait until rates come down. Rates come down. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what if they don't? That's correct. And there's starting to be a, an ever growing feeling that maybe rates are going to settle in for a little bit, kind of close to where we're at, or maybe a slight reduction. Right. And so that is the question. I need to do business every year. I can't just sit on the sidelines and wait. So I don't have the luxury of, hey, let me just sit on the sidelines for a couple of years and wait for things to normalize, right? So if you're in the situation I'm in, which is you build a company, you want to keep people employed and you want to transact in a market like this, you have to come up with creative solutions in different ways to look at things, right? And so that's what we've spent the last couple of years doing. You know, we have a couple of different things that we think are viable solutions in today's market. They all solve different issues, but you know, certainly there are, there is opportunity out there. So what are some of those things that people can do? And like, how do you, how do you look at it? Like, what if, what are you doing in your company, Gary? So I think there's a bunch of different ways to look at it, but the number, the, the, the strategy that we've settled on is there's two places that we can affect. We think we can affect things the most. Okay. One is cost to operate the buildings. Right. If I can be more efficient in my cost to operate a building than somebody else, that gives me an advantage. OK, so that's one area that we're going to focus and I'll, I'll talk to you about how we're going to do that. The second area is, can we make our cost of capital less expensive than what it currently is? Right. So those are the two areas where we think there's opportunity. So. I'll start on the cost of operating the building because I think that's a little easier and I think people can get their head around that easier, right? So I'll give you a perfect example. One of the things that AI is able to do now is it can verify income for you. Where before you had to send something out to a, you know, I think generally the way it would work is, you know, we would send a spot, people would have to upload their pay stubs and fill out some information. And then we would use that to verify their income, right? And everybody now these days is using this fraud detection system too, because there's a lot of fraudulent pay stubs and stuff that come through. So that process is a pretty manual process. Well, now there's a way through the different operating systems to just have that automatically verified. And you do it and it taps into the people's payroll service, verifies the information and sends it back. So another example in that particular category is a lot of times people get paid bi-monthly or bi-weekly and they go in to fill out the little form and they check off the wrong box or, you know, they fill in their net income instead of their gross income. And there's some manual error that takes place and then you're potentially going to turn somebody down or you got to go through this manual verification process. Well, now if the computer and the AI can do it all for you, you don't have to that streamlines the process. Well, that helps you, right? Like simple things like that 
auto scheduling your appointments through AI, all of these things can help reduce the cost of operating your buildings, right? And so our goal is to reduce our cost of operating the buildings by 2%. And if we can do that, that 2% goes right to the bottom line of profitability. And that's a big deal. Wow. That's also the AI, what's going to come. We're in the, last year was in the let's play with it stage. This year, we're in the, we better figure out its stage because every second counts. That's right. If you're not working on AI as part of what you're doing, it's, you know, it's a problem. And, and think about it this way. Like if, if it goes from the average cost to operate a multifamily building is 36% to 33%. If you bought a lot of buildings when it was 36%, you just picked up 3%. That's a lot, a lot of money, right? So there's an opportunity there. If you're looking at the market, you're looking at what's going to happen in the future to say a building that operates like this today will make me this much more tomorrow. And I can sell that to investors and get people to get excited about it because it kind of intuitively makes sense. I can show them a couple areas like the things that we just talked about where you could see the benefit and then you can extrapolate that out that there'll be more of that as we go forward. So one of our basic tenants is that the, the cost to operate buildings is going to go down over the next five years. So if we can buy at today's expenses, that's good for us. That's pretty interesting. Using AI for the adjustment of cost on a building, be the solution. Figure it out. How do you spend less to make the same money or hopefully down the line as you condense the processes, be able to earn even more income on that asset? That's right. Because the, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I was going to say the other part of it is it, it makes people nervous when you start to say, oh, well, AI, and you're going to do this, and that's going to be less jobs. But for me, what it means is I get to use brain power on bigger issues versus the idea that, hey, now I got to have somebody going in and checking if somebody didn't fill their pay stub out, right? on this. That's not thinking work, right? Like, I want great no, people definitely to Definitely not. Be, Right. So now I can do way more work with the same amount of people and use their brain power to leverage for even better results. That's the idea. It's interesting what we can come up with when we're our backs are against the wall. And I'm, by the way, I'm not suggesting, Gary, that yours is. But, you know, in the real estate space, we all had to look at costs and expenses um, across the board and you know, we found holes where money was leaking out. That's right. We definitely did. And and look, I say anybody that was in the development side of the business like I was in the last two years, every one of our projects was over budget and behind schedule and over budget because of labor constraint, because of interest rates going up um, and behind schedule because you can't get material, all of these things. And so the people that are making it through the other end of this are the people that underwrote deals conservatively going in and who could write some checks when the mistakes that they didn't think were going to happen or when these market conditions went against them and were able to stay in business. So I, I always tell everybody, I lost a lot of money over the last two years, but I'm still alive. I'm still in business. And now, you know, as the market resets itself, I'll be ready to take advantage of it because now we have the opportunity to think of how to get better. Well, yes. And it's at the end of the day, it's business, right? Mm -hmm. It's not heart surgery where mm -hmm. you're laying on a table and getting your heart taken out so you can live. <laughs> we can always make the business better. And it always it could always be better and it could always be worse. I say right. being an entrepreneur and a business owner is not for the faint of heart. You got to take the punches get knocked down and get the hell back up quick. That's right. But you and I haven't been through a couple cycles. It's good for other people to hear. Like, you know, I, I hate when people get on a podcast or get on somewhere and all they do is tell you all their wins. It's like, man, you have to have some losses too. <laughs> and you have to be human and, and people have to understand that like you talk about, there's wins, there's losses. But if we keep getting up every day, we keep fighting, we're going to come up with solutions and we're going to be better off for it. And, and that's what that's what we're doing. That's what you're doing in this market. I think that it is a market that will shake out 
a lot of owners, professionals that have been able to ride the wave just because. And when you have skills, persistence, consistency, resiliency, that is where there's going to be a lot of opportunities that are going to come as people, different professionals in the industry, it shakes itself out. Absolutely. I mean, it's tough because when I posted a video online, which I think you saw about, hey, we can help you make deals work if, you're, if your deals are struggling. And a lot of the deals that we see coming in are deals where, unfortunately, the equity put in by the investors has been wiped out over the last two years by properties being worth a little bit less and overruns and costs and all that stuff. And what we're spending time trying to do with people is say, okay, first thing you got to realize is the situation you're in. The equity that you have has been lost. Now, can that equity come back over 10 years? It can. But in order for that, you know, there needs to be a reset of expectations. You need additional capital. These problems in real estate can be solved with time if you're willing to do that and take your money down the road and just understand the situation you're in. It's, it's the, it's the best thing anybody can do is understand like, look, I can't be in a sunken cost thing where I paid $10 million to do this and it's worth eight and I'm going to hang on to it being worth 10. The answer is it's worth eight now. Now we think in 10 years, it'll be worth 14. The issue is you got to get to 10 years. And the way to do that is to recapitalize these deals and bring in new money. And it'll be a long time before you get paid, but you will get paid and you will make money. You just have to have a longer term view of it. Right. I mean, that has happened to a tremendous amount of people in this market. And that's one of the it's, it's not the solution they want to hear, but it's one of the solutions we offer. So you mentioned about getting capital cheaper. And is that a cost? What does that like look like, that capital stack? Is that private money, bank money? What does that mean? So for us, here's here's what it means. If, if you think of it at the highest level, right? When you borrow money today, let's just say that interest rates are roughly 6.5% today. If you were to go out and borrow that money at 65 when you add in the amount that you're paying back in principal, every dollar you borrow is costing you roughly six, every hundred dollars is costing you 7.66%, right? So the interest rate is six and a half, but from a cash flow perspective, you're really paying 7.66% for your money. So the issue is nobody can make a deal work or get a deal to a 7.66% yield right now. Right. So every yes. dollar you borrow is costing you more money than the buildings generated. Well, that's a fundamental problem, right? Fun, so very, fund, very, yes, very, very deep problem. Right. And so you can underwrite a hundred projects and it doesn't really matter. Like you're, you're not getting there. If you do a good job, you can get something maybe to a six, nine, you're still upside down, right? Like we're not seeing deals that are penciling out at where the yield on them is eight or eight and a half percent. They, you know, they just don't exist without a lot of risk. So what do you do? So what we've done is we said, okay, well, we're going to go in and try and change our capital stack around and try and go after just stabilized buildings. So not buildings that are, you know, development deals, which is kind of what we've done. Say, all right, well, if I were to go after stabilized deals, there's a little less risk in them, right? Could I get people to sign up that wanted to get cash flow today to take a return of less than 7.66% out of the gate? Because again, over 10 years, I'm going to build that cash flow year over year. We all believe rents will go up. But if I can get people to want to put their money in at let's call it five and a half percent, when I got to get it at the market at 7.66, well, that difference is enough to make a real estate deal work, right? And so now my job is to go out and get the money and say, hey, look, you might make 5.5 in year one and you might make 5.75 in year two as rents go up. And by year 10, you're going to be making seven and a half percent on your money. But we're buying stabilized assets. We're buying things that are really good. So if you like that cash flow, I'm going to get you that cash flow. And then when we sell the building, I'm going to get in another big chunk of money then. 
and you might make it, you know, nine to 12 percent on your money over a 10 year period of time and get all the tax benefits involved with real estate. If that's interesting to you, then I can help you. And now I have a competitive advantage on the market because my cost of capital is less than other people. So essentially, that's what we're doing to try and pencil real estate deals in the market where they, the fundamentals of them just don't work. But over 10 years, the fundamentals of them do work. You know, not that this is shocking to anybody, but I went back and looked at properties from 1940 through today and said, in any 10 year given, any 10 year given period of time, have they ever gone down in value and has rent ever not increased? And the answer to that question is no. So when I'm sitting down and talking to you, Maria, and say, hey, give me your money, I'm saying, hey, look, I'm pretty confident through all the different cycles we've been through that this real estate 10 years from now will be worth more than it is today and we'll be collecting more in rent. And if those two th things are true, you're going to make a decent return on your money for the risk that you're taking, which is not a lot, right? Because we're only buying stabilized stuff, right? So where two years ago, I was getting people 15 to 22% returns on development deals that had some risk inherent in them. I now need to get them into deals that where they can make, you know, five to 8% on their money, but the risk is way less because the fundamentals of building any new construction right now are not good. They're just not. Not good, money too expensive, cost of building, labor too expensive, cost of goods too expensive, land too expensive. I didn't see any positive in any of those four things. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. But it's funny because like when you hear it, when we're talking about these things for a year, I'm yelling and screaming every time we look at a deal. How come we can't make anything work? We got to lower our costs. We got to, and you know, and then finally, you know, I've talked to enough people. I looked at enough stuff and it just, it doesn't matter what anybody does. That, that math just doesn't work. It does. No, it certainly doesn't work for a multifamily development. And then, you know, with all the new development that's already out of the ground and finishing, I think that'll take some time over time to really absorb it all. That's right. And so the other spot to sit where I believe you can make some money still is in out sale, right? Like we're working on a project where we're going to build 169 out sale townhouses. And I think that's a very good market to be in with a lack of, you know, home ownership product available specifically in Philadelphia at a decent price point. We think we're going to hit the market market really, really well there and, and serve a need that, you know, that we have in this city and, and make some money uh, doing it. So what neighborhood's that? Winfield Heights, Overbrook Park area. So they're going to be for sale. You they're were going to, were you originally going to keep those, weren't you? As for rent? Not, no, we always wanted to, we have a rental building that's a second phase of this. Oh, different project. So, yeah. This is a two phase project where we're going to do the out sale piece first and then the apartment building second. So when I say no deals pencil, this is an example of a deal penciling. Anytime you can find a deal where you can do out sales to buy down your basis and end up with your apartment building at the end, that still works. <laughs> you can find those projects. Those projects are home runs. That's a and great pro problem to have, right? Exactly. But what's the price point going to be on those? I think, so we have some stacked condos, which I think are going to be- you know, in a 275 range. And then the singles, I think, are going to be in the 450 range. So really kind of product that is hard to find in the Your city. Your first so time home buyer product. And I'm sure they'll be able to pick up the, uh, probably the majority minority thousand dollar credit that some of the banks are have right now, like Wisfus and Prosperity. There's a couple other ones also that will provide that just because of the location. Whether they're a first time buyer or not. That's right. There's a there's a ton of product out there to, to help people in this price point. So, you know, we're really yeah. excited. Councilman Jones is super excited because we're in his district. He is very excited that this project is, is happening and was very helpful in helping us get it approved. So That's excellent. Does it have a name? Not an official name as of yet. It's very hotly contested. The council I person. see. I see. Mm -hmm. We're going to throw it in the hat or are we going to whiteboard it? <laughs> the council person has some names that he would like to see. I see. To <laughs> oh, okay. 
when do you project coming out of, are you already out of the ground or? We're doing site work right now. So we're probably four or five months away from, you know, putting the so first buildings up. This is a spring of 2025 delivery. We should have some earlier than that. Yeah. I, I think we'll be, I think we'll be building models in the next six months and then, yeah, so you're probably right. Spring in 2025 is, is probably when the first people will be moving in. That's positive and exciting. Yes, it is. So I have a question for you. I recently just read about this, and I'm curious if you know what I'm talking about. Because I asked a couple people, and they didn't know. Have you heard about the when they build skyscraper and then the market either... It, bust a year later or right around the same time. The skyscraper index? I have not heard of the skyscraper index. What? So what is it? So it started, like they have data back to like 1901 or 1903. Right. And some of the data that I, I received, because I follow this guy, he had brought it to my attention, like the Empire State building, for example, right? When the real estate market is in, it's so optimistic, people start to develop like these skyscrapers. So they have the, Ele the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Sears Tower. And for example, like the Empire State Building in, what was it, 1931, it opened the market crashed in 1929. That building was already built, being built for years because nobody decides to build a building unless they're super duper optimistic. Like right now, I think it's the Jetta, Jetta I don't even have to say it, Jetta building. And it's, you know, it's a, a kilometer, a kilometer high. I did not know that. You were giving me all kinds of good information. I don't know any of this. And so if you look back and you see Empire State Building, Sears Tower, um, the Burj Khalifa, which is the building that they built in 2013. It ended in, it actually opened in 2010, but they were building it for the five years before that. Hmm. So like right now they're saying it's like 2003, 2002, 2003. And we basically, because this new building is set to, Open in 27. And that will be the height. And they're saying, because they looked at the data and they said that real estate is 18 year cycle. And that will be the completion of like the 18 year cycle. It's very interesting. That is interesting. extremely interesting. So we got 1100 days to make our money. There you go. And then we well, have to be cash rich so we can buy up all the other crap. That's exactly right. That is exactly so, right. Yeah, I thought you'd find I thought if you didn't know about it that you would find it interesting. I read it a couple of days ago and I've been blown away about it. I that was is like, interesting. That makes so much sense. Because what per crazy person in their right mind, unless the real estate market was so overinflated, would decide to build a building that's a kilometer tall. And I read about it this morning. Fifty nine elevators. Wow. No Crazy. one elevator to take you to the top. You'd have to take three, I believe, to get to the top of it. Oh, my God. That's crazy. That's crazy, right? That's and crazy. the same architect who's building it built the Khalif. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's, you're not going to get any help from me. I don't know how to Khalifa, say it either. Burj Khalifa in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia. Yep. Okay. So pretty, pretty amazing stuff. The guy's from Chicago, who's the architect. And yeah, they had to figure out the vortex of the wind. And so the building didn't like tornadoes, so it didn't fall into itself and create a tornado. It's really wild. That's amazing. Yeah, that's way beyond my pay grade. I'm just trying to take a percent or two off operating costs. <laughs> I've been getting up earlier and spending time reading things and just like me time. And it's really improved my overall being. That's awesome. Well, they gotta have a good morning not, routine. 
yes, the morning routine and it's quiet and, uh, and there's nothing happening. So I do you have a morning routine that you follow? I do. So there's a book out there called The Miracle Morning. And it's, this is Tim a guy. Ferris. Isn't that Tim Ferriss? No, Tim Ferriss is the oh, wrong person. Hour, uh, work week and a couple other books. Tim Ferriss is a great. Two Titans. Correct. He wrote that book. This is a guy Hell. by name Hal Elrod. Hal Elrod. Wrote, wrote, wrote the book and he basically looked at what the most successful people in the world do as their morning routine. And it's basically the same for everybody. They get up, they work out, they do some light reading, they do some meditation, then they journal, and then they start their day. That's that's the routine. So that's your routine? I try to make it my routine. I'm not going to tell you that every day it's my routine, but I can tell you, you really that I am a morning person. And if I don't work out in the morning, I'm miserable all day. Oh, are you a 5 a.m. I do like to get up at 5 a.m. Yes. Well, I was one today. <laughs> Welcome to and the I'm club. Not a five, and I'm not a 5 a.m. I would like to get back to be a 6:30 a.m. But I'm not a 10 a.m. either. Like I'm, I we have an 8:30 conference call every day, so I'm ready to go before that. But nice. I nice. think it's important that you know people work though personal development and their mindset because Gary. This is the most expensive real estate we own. <laughs> that is true. Is right here between mm -hmm. our ears for the people that can't say on the, they're listening. Sorry. They're listening between our ears. And if we don't control what's up here, then that's it. You are 100% correct. And I love to run and listen to audio books and podcasts and different things that get my mind moving in different directions. It, I find that relaxing and, I, and it certainly helps me. Who do you like? So the podcast that I like is the All In Podcast. That is one of my favorites to listen to. Right now I'm listening to a book by Peter Thiel or Thiel. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Thiel. PayPal guy on how to do disruption in industries and things. And so I'm enjoying that. That's it. I haven't read it, but yeah, he's pretty interesting, that guy. For sure, PayPal. Huh. Who would have thunk it? That's right. But, you know, what was interesting, the most interesting I, thing that I found in the book is that, you know, so I always thought, I, I didn't really understand how it worked between him and, and Elon Musk. I thought that they kind of had this idea and then Elon came in and took it to the finish line. But that's not really what happened. They both had competing companies. And instead of fighting it out, they got together and sat in the room and decided to join up and own 50% each of the company instead of fighting with each other and driving margin down and push PayPal forward that way. Yeah, well, those two guys are very, very intelligent people because generally that's not happening. Correct. That is not the general gonna, rule of thumb. You're just going to battle until somebody's dead or maybe both are. That's maybe exactly right. In the toilet. So I want to switch gears a minute. I want to talk about, have you, I'm, I'm sure you have, or maybe you haven't, but what about different asset classes? So we've looked at trying to systemize some other asset classes. The one we're closest on is trying to buy, you know, leases that have short lease terms left on them at decent premiums in really good locations. So by way of example, like a Walgreens that only has three years left on its lease, but it's in a very good location. And we feel confident that we can re-tenant that building down the road. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at because, you know, generally I'm not into the industrial space or the warehouse space. We kind of are staying away from that. Those are really competitive markets right now. So we do see the retail space as a spot where there might be some opportunity. And so we're trying to look at how would we systemize that and scale that a little bit. And, you know, that's our general premise right now. We can buy all bank buildings. We can buy all Walgreens, things that, you know, we think are well located that we believe we can get, you know, in the eight, nine percent cap range range and then repurpose those buildings to long term tenants when leases are up. We, we think there's some opportunity there. We have not executed on any of that yet, but we are spending some time in that area to see if that premise is, is reasonable or not. Walgreens has pay big money and a credit uh, tenant. So that's right. But they're going out of business, right? And their leases are, you know, the, the question is, what Walgreens. do you do with, what do you do with 13,000 square feet? 
in a good location to try and get that same kind of rent, right? That's that's the box you're trying to fill. Because if you can and retenant it, now all of a sudden you got a low six cap that you bought at an eight, eight and a half and you've created some value, right? So know. something cool like virtual reality, something. Yeah, those are the kinds of things, right? You got to think of what the future is going to look like and try and deliver on it. Now, I won't do it unless we unless we get a very vivid vision of what that looks like. I'd rather go out and buy stabilized multifamily assets that have thinner returns and just keep hitting singles and you know turn around with a lot of units in in ten years. Got to hit. You got to keep hitting singles. Otherwise, if you don't, you'll never hit a home run. That's exactly right. That's a mistake. I think people just try to hit a home run. You can't just hit a home run. It doesn't work like that. You gotta hit a lot of singles. You get a lot of you'll get fly balls. You'll get, you know, whatever other I don't know the terminology, but I do watch the baseball sometimes. But in business, you have to just keep getting up to bat. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, and never ever ever give up. I think that's uh that's an underrated thing. Never ever ever giving up. Find a way, find a way to make it work. So Gary, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? I think the biggest thing I would do differently if I were to do it all over again was focus on a neighborhood and really try and dominate in that neighborhood where I was really nervous and tried to have a little bit in a bunch of different neighborhoods. You know, I'd rather be the guy that owns most of the stuff in Fishtown, you know, instead of owning two buildings in Fishtown and two buildings in Maniunk and two buildings in Graduate Hospital and two buildings over here. I was afraid to get an over-concentration in one market. But if I were doing it all over again, I think I would have realized that expertise in that market is worth a lot. And if you believe in it enough to do the first building, you know, you should probably keep on going. Had I done that in Fishtown or Fairmount or Graduate Hospital, you know, when I was first starting to buy, I think I would have been able to scale more with less work, you know, less getting to know a new RCO, less getting to know, you know, a new council person, less getting to know a new neighborhood. Like, you know, I would just know those things inherently and be able to move faster and have more units and have more scale and create a little bit of a brand that would be more recognizable by neighborhood. Hmm. Interesting. I, I can, I can see why. I mean, you got the economies of scale of like boot, even just boots on the ground maintenance and you know driving all over the city and um, yeah, well, we don't have crystal balls and we can't go backwards. So we only can, and we can't, we all, and we can't, can only connect the dots backwards. That's right. That's right. And you don't look at it like one of the things I tell people is that I would buy interest rate hedges on every deal we did for the last 10 years. And I would lose money on them every year because rates were going down and going down and going down. And then finally, the last couple of years, they protected me when rates went way up. I had some interest rate protection and made it easier for us to to get through some of the deals that we had to do without losing kind of as much equity as maybe some other people did. And through that process, like what we learned is we were super conservative all the way from beginning to end, even as we got more successful and added more units, we didn't change our risk profile and what we were willing to accept for risk. So we had a couple of basic tents, like we're not going to build like all these townhouses we're building. We won't build something that we can't rent and have it cover itself. Right. So it would be easy to get into building two or three million dollar houses where there's more margin, but there's way more risk in those things. And, and we just don't believe in taking outsized risk. So we try and do stuff that's a little more down the center. Uh, you know, not you're not like we talked about earlier, you're never going to get crazy home runs on them, but you're going to be consistent and you're going to grow your portfolio and you're going to turn around in 10 or 15 years and go, wow. This is wonderful, right? And that that has worked worked very well for us over the years, and and I think it's it's something that we got to remind ourselves of now, as you know, like I don't have very much interest rate risk right now, or loans that I'm worried about, you know, coming maturing, and then you know my interest rates going up two percent, my cash flow not being good. Everything we do is to try and eliminate as much risk as possible. So we can count on income over long periods of time. Well, the real estate game, as we know, is a long haul. Yes, Money is. is made over time in real estate. And 
the longer you're in the game, the rate, the rates, are, they're gonna, you're gonna see it all. So they go up, they go down, they stay flat. But one thing That's is, right. people always have to have a place to live. And there's plenty of people who not only just want to buy a first-time home buyer, but also they're going to rent. And, you know, transient, people coming to go to school, people going to, um, you know, work in the city for a couple of years and then, you know, for uh, maybe their residency or they're going to college or and not everybody's going to buy a property. Although I'm a big proponent of home, first-time buyers and home ownership, but there's a reason why there's apartment buildings. That, that's right. And uh, look, I think you're going to see a change in the apartment market too. There's a lot of stuff coming towards trying to help tenants, you know, with rewards and home ownership and different things along those lines. And, and we're working on something that we think is going to be really innovative that we're going to be launching in the next couple of months, which is a plan for tenants to have a path to home ownership and how to get some money set aside to do that by working with landlords. And, and it's going to be really exciting. And that's, oh, that's well, we have step. to talk about, we should talk about that because I have something I've been working on with a group and yeah, I'd like to share, I'd like to share it with you. If you I don't I know if you've spoken to them, I don't think you have, but we could take, we'll take that offline. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I can, I have a guy, John, that's running that for us. And I'm happy to have him talk to you about what we're doing and, and review. Yeah, what we're doing and definitely. Awesome. So something. Gary, guilty pleasure. What's my guilty pleasure? Yeah. Can I say beer? Yeah. I could say red wine. <laughs> there you go. I love, I love coming home on a, I don't typically drink much during the week, but I do by the time I get home on a Friday night love to have a nice cold, nice beer. cold beer that is correct it there is you wonderful. go simple simple mm -hmm. that's it absolutely so you know one last question before we wrap up what are you most excited about for the future i'm excited about the idea that there's going to be significant changes that we haven't thought about that are going to make it easier to do what we do and to make it easier you know just for everybody to be in the in the space that we're in. I think there's a lot, a lot of change coming, but uh, to me, change is usually good. It's usually making things better. And so I think that, you know, there's always a lot of people fear the future, but the future is in my mind, good. It's change. It's good things. It's getting better. And so I'm excited to work on things that are going to make our industry better. Well, I say every day, just make a little tiny dent, a little tiny dent. Just, a little dent every day, every day, every day. Compound effect. Eventually, it will get better. We got a new mayor in town. We got lots of stuff going on. A new president of Center City Association. There's a lot. A new, who else? City of Philadelphia Visitor Center. We have a new CEO there. There's a lot of change. And I think it's, you know, time to bring a new regime. Yeah, I'm excited that for the new mayor and the new regime and everything that, that, you know, I think the city's got a bright future. So it's exciting. Awesome. Well, Gary Jonas, thank you for being on Be The Solution podcast. And where can people find you if they want to reach out? They can find me at Gary, G-A-R-Y, at howgroup, H-O-W, group.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. It was wonderful.